Yeah, good morning, everybody. Welcome to MNR Wednesday. And um, it gives me great pleasure to, to introduce uh, today's speaker, Colin Farquharson, who many of you will certainly know. And Colin will continue on the theme of um, inversion. So just to run through uh, the speakers for the next weeks, and then I introduce Colin. Uh, next week, we have NASA Megbell, uh, who will talk to us about his code, ModiM. Um, that's a sort of a different time. Those of you in North America are going to have to get up very early for that one. Um, and then we have Vladimir Pusyarev on EM inversion using neural networks. After that is uh, Kerry Key. Um, many of you will know Kerry's code, Mari2DEM. Um, and he'll be telling us about that. Kerry, Kerry makes his code freely available, as does NASA, of course, for academic use. Whoops. Uh, and Randy Mackey on geologically consistent inversion of geophysical data. And then we have a couple of sort of different talks. Uh, Nadine Villette will, will tell us about her career as a geophysicist. And this one is, is to basically hopefully reach out to, to uh, young people who are wondering about whether to have a career in, a, in geophysics. Um, and she'll tell us about the a, a culmination of unplanned opportunities. And I think most of our careers are, are that. And then the week after, uh, the planned speaker had to, uh, had to pull out. And so I'm going to jump in and give you a talk that I gave a, couple of, a few years ago in, in China, um, publishing in, in Western geoscience literature. And then Malcolm Sambridge will, will return to inversion and Malcolm Sambridge will give us a, a talk on optical transport and geophysical inversion. Malcolm is the uh, Benno Gutenberg medalist for AGU for last year and for EGU this year. As you know, the, you can access and register for all of these on the MNR webpage on MTNet. And um, you can view prior ones. Uh, there's a video link and a presentation link you are you are on a Zoom webinar, and so you, you've got a little less functionality than a meeting. You can send a message on, in the chat function. You can raise your hand if you want to speak at, at the end of the talk during the Q&A. And there's a, a Q&A box, and you can send uh, questions in at any time you like. And um, if Colin is able to, and it doesn't interrupt the flow, he'll, he'll answer short claritative questions. But if... Uh, but, Primarily, most of the questions will be left to the end. Please, uh, please keep your Q and A in the in the Q and A rather than in the chat. So today's speaker gives me great pleasure to to welcome Colin. I've known Colin for quite a time since he uh, we were just chatting about it. I must have met him in the early nineties when when I went to UBC. Um, Colin got his bachelor's uh, from the same place as I got my PhD of, uh, from Edinburgh in nineteen ninety. Quite a, quite a bit of time after I got my PhD <laughs> and uh, did his PhD under Doug, who, who gave us a wonderful uh, MNR a few weeks ago. He finished his uh, PhD in 95 and he stayed working with Doug as a postdoc for 10 years, then moved to Memorial initially as a research associate in the INCO Innovation Center. And then he was hired by the university in 2008 as assistant professor and now is a full professor there. So it gives me great pleasure to, to hand over to, to Colin and uh, let's, hear you, let's hear this wonderful Thanks, talk. Thanks, Alan. Thanks very much. Let's see. Okay, so the share screen. Okay, so hopefully that is the presentation view and everybody's seen that correctly. And I'm going to assume that if yep. it's not- Yeah, it looks fine, it, Colin, looks fine. Thank you, I'm going to assume that if I do anything wrong, Alan's going to come in and tell me uh, that I'm doing it wrong, so great. Um, thanks again, Alan, um, I mean, for the introduction. Also, thanks very much for this opportunity to speak in this seminar series. Um, also, I think, I think this seminar series is a really good idea. Uh, I think it's great for community building, for helping us keep track of who's doing what and all the various bits and pieces of science and advancements that are happening. So 
I really like this idea and yeah, I hope we can continue doing this as a community when things are back to normal. Uh, okay, so yeah, EMMT data inversion. So I'm going to hopefully try and say something useful and interesting about that. Um, so a bit of a preamble, uh, a couple of things I want to make sure I say at the start uh, and not forget to say. Uh, so basically I'm going to talk about some things that are sort of front and center of my mind when I think about EM and MT inversion. Um, hopefully this will sort of touch on some educational aspects, educational content. Hopefully some of it will touch on research as well. Hopefully it doesn't fall between the two. I think that's Alan had, Alan had me listed as E and R, so I'm going to try and touch them both. Um, as for sort of the couple of comments that I want to make sure that I make, um, I mean, we're dealing with big computational problems in EM inversion, and that influences everything that we do still. Um, I mean, I, you know, every now and again, I sort of wander into gravity inversion, and perhaps arguably people doing gravity inversion, you know, they can be doing a model with a million cells, 10 million cells in this minimum structure style inversion. And maybe they're thinking that, yeah, that's a good enough number of cells for them, a fine enough resolution. And so they're maybe starting to be happy. Maybe. Uh, yeah, very much from the EM perspective, uh, th th this presentation. So we'll see if some of these opinions are maybe not quite correct or very truly biased by being from EM. Uh, but so maybe, so maybe the gravity people are happy with the number of cells they've got and the, the resolution. But then when we take that across to EM inversion, then yeah, sure, a million cells, that'd be nice. But then we've got data, this frequency or time dimension, you know, in MT, we're making measurements. We've got data at dozens of frequencies. Uh, if we're doing time to be in EM, we've got one or two dozen times, time channels, perhaps more. And then in the control source EM, we've also got sources. So, so yeah, we're dealing with much bigger computational problems than some aspects of geophysics. And that, that's a theme throughout EM and I probably mentioned that again, but I wanted to get it out front. Also sort of comparing with say gravity magnetic inversion, then for sure EM is, it's a non-linear inverse problem. And so that means we're always having to think about well, sensitivities and a Jacobian matrix if we're doing a descent based method. And also it's going to involve iterations. So this linearized iterative approach. And so that's again, a fundamental issue with our inversion of EM data. Um, finally for this slide, a disclaimer. Um, you know, I'm going to show lots of pictures and I'm going to try and indicate you know, work that has been done in the past from the literature as well as ongoing. Um, I must admit for some of the pictures, I just grab the ones that I know exist. Uh, and so from our, some of those from our own work, there probably are better examples that you folks have done. Uh, and so I apologize for perhaps not using some of your examples when I should have, I just went for the, the easy option with the pictures that I know of. Okay, preamble, the outline. So I'd, I'd like to, um, kind of do a bit of background on inversion, but all right, it's just optimization. We always do it by optimization. Uh, so I want to go through the background a little bit and not in a, not in a sort of truly educational sort of course type of way, but just again, the things I think about when thinking of doing inversion for EM. So the collection of things there that I'll go through. Um, then I want to touch on forward modeling, some aspects of forward modeling, because of course that's arguably the most important part of any inversion routine way of doing things. You know, we have to be able to calculate data for a candidate model. Uh, and I'm not going to dwell too much on forward modeling, but just talk about some aspects of it. Uh, then talk about sensitivities, this business of, yeah, it's a um, nonlinear inverse problem. The standard way of dealing with it is uh, some descent based method and that involves the derivatives. And so, yeah, we need to be calculating sensitivities. So I'm going to mention, look at briefly the sort of typical ways, the options that we have for doing it. Then just mention the normal typical way, whether it's Gauss-Newton or, or some other descent based method. Um, then I'm going to have the conclusion slide because that's the best place to have the conclusion slide in this flow. Um, then I'm going to sort of float out a few other thoughts. Uh, indicate a little 
bit of the work we're doing, which is going in a different direction and the reasons for doing that. Uh, also want to think about D plus models for a minute or two. Anyways, the, the tail end of the presentation. Uh, so this, this sort of first section, this, this inversion background. And so in, in thinking about what I wanted to say in this talk, I kind of wanted to sort of set things up from the beginning, like, you know, because in, inversion, I mean, the, and, 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 and thinking in terms of where the name comes from, it's like, you know, the inverse of a function. Uh, you can think of a function x squared as a function, and so the inverse is the square root. And so you have your square root function, you stick in your number, and woohoo, you get out your, the result from your inversion. And so, yeah, a little while ago, uh, people were investigating whether this was possible or not for EM, so very much the context of 1DMT. Uh, this is one particular example from uh, Dick Bailey, 1970, but actually I'm lifting these two equations from the description in the, in the book by Ken Whittle and Doug Oldenburg. And so, you know, this is just to indicate this, you know, the, this hope for doing an inversion where you stick your data into your formula, turn the handle and oops, out pops the model, the answer. Uh, so the top line there, let's see, get the cursor back. You know, so this is just the, the one DMT response. So it's the electric field in D by DZ of the electric field, essentially the magnetic field for the one D case. So that's our NT response. And so here on the surface in the face of things, it looks like, oh, we stick our data in here. We do whatever the math is telling us. And oh, hey presto, out pops our, our model of the subsurface, our kind of connectivity model. So inversion in the sense of like an inverse formula. Of course, that doesn't work for all sorts of reasons. You know, that was found early on to not be a useful way of doing it. Um, the, the thing I'm going to concentrate on is that, yeah, this integration is over frequency. So we need to know the empty response at all frequencies, which we never do. We know our data at, you know, we've got discrete data points, a collection of data. Um, also is noise. And thinking about this way of doing it, how on earth you'd uh, generalize this to multi-dimensions, who knows. Um, but I'm just going to concentrate on the reality <clears throat> in that we've got discrete data and data points. And so these are just uh, some pictures from uh, the Occam inversion paper by Steve Constable, uh, Constable Parker, Parker and Constable. And just the, the point I want to show here is, yeah, real data, data points at discrete frequencies, discrete periods, and hopefully we've got error bars on those. And, you know, error bars are kind of important. So I'm going to look at this, uh, th th this other picture, uh, this is D series activity again from that same paper. And, you know, real data, data points and error bars. And it's critically important because, I mean, AB over two, the spacing between the current electrodes, we've got 10 to the five meters over there, which is, Nice good distance between the current electrodes. Uh, and so that's the, the, the biggest separation over to the right. So those are the data points that are telling us about structure deepest down in the ground, the, the structure that we're really interested in seeing and, and figuring out and determining. And so we've got the error bars on those data points. And so, you know, with the error bar, the size of the error bar in this last data point, I mean, that's kind of big, suggesting a noisier value, a noisier datum there. So maybe. Maybe you don't, you do not trust so much this uh, apparent resistivity turning over, and maybe you go with this dashed one. I mean, this is just in here to illustrate, yeah, the importance of error bars and being able to quantify in a useful way the uncertainties in our data. And looking at this from the inversion point of view is that, well, if we have that information, we can totally take that into account uh, in our in our quantification of how well the calculated data are matching our uh, observed data. And so the standard sum of squares measure of data misfit we're all very familiar with, with each observed value, you subtract from it the corresponding calculated data from our candidate model, normalized by the standard deviation of the noise. And then the sum of the squares, I mean, that's the standard most typical way of quantifying our data misfit. And so then we're transitioning from this sort of inverse, inverse problem where we're looking for the inverse function into looking at 
our data points, our discrete data points with noise. And yeah, we're wanting to reproduce those and reproduce them adequately uh, given the noise that we have. And so in some ways we, again, from the inversion side, we, we've, got all the, we've got a lot of the tools. We've already arguably got all the tools we need in order to deal with whatever noise we might have in the observations. Um, this is just a collection of, I mean, that's the, the, uh, one of these norms measures for the size of a vector. So you can apply that to your vector of normalized discrepancies. And so the sum of squares for the L2 norm, but of course you can generalize this into something that is sum of squares for small values of discrepancy, but then is a straight line for uh, larger values known as a Huber measure. Uh, the picture on the right, or that would be this curve B, so it's quadratic in the middle, but then heads off in a straight line. Woo uh, so kind of mixes and matches. Uh, the uh, measure from you know, the minimum support used by Oleg Portnyagin and Michael Stanoff. Um, there's all sorts of measures for quantifying the, well, that you can use in multiple places. I'm just talking about them here in terms of quantifying the, the data misfit. Uh, this picture in here is to remind me that, yes, if the noise in your data are coming from a Gaussian distribution, so picture of Gaussian distributions on the left, um, then yeah, the sum of squares measure of data misfit is statistically speaking the most appropriate to use. Uh, if you're, uh, if the noise in the measurements is following a Laplace distribution, so picture on the right, then hey, the sum of the absolute values of the discrepancies is the appropriate measure, statistically speaking, for your, for your measure of data misfit. And so, you know, here we are, if we know the probability density function, so if we can describe the behavior, the character of our noise, then yeah, we can, we can build that into our inversion technology. Um, still on the misfit, still on the data misfit. Um, I mean, the, so I am not an expert by a million miles on, on statistical or probabilistic ways of doing things. Uh, so I'm lifting all of these words directly from Tarantola's book. Uh, and so, you know, in this, you know, in the way of looking at an inverse problem based on probabilities, then certainly the, you know, the likelihood function, so how likely is the data that you have in your hand, how likely is that to have come from a certain model, a candidate model, uh, that can totally be expressed in terms of the full-on probability density functions. Uh, in yellow here is just a couple of examples. The one at the bottom is the uh, for for Gaussian distributed noise with the uh, covariance matrix. Um, this is for oh uh, when the, the the sum of the absolute values is appropriate, and so that can go into your probability density function that is the the likelihood function. And so here I'm trying to indicate that not only can we come up with a measure of data misfit that's appropriate for the noise in sort of each individual data point, but also this, you know, if we have correlated noise uh, between neighboring data points, then in principle at least, not sure if anybody's done this yet, um, but in principle at least, you know, we've got this covariance matrix into which we could put information about correlated data, uh, the correlated noise in the, in the data. Um, so, so yes, I think we have all the technology, all the capabilities in our inverse methodology to, yeah, properly describe in the inversion scheme, the noise that we might have in our data. Um, so that's one point. I'm going to have a few of these asides. So the big red aside is sort of the warning. Um, in terms of looking at the fit to the data, <clears throat> then you know, it is also possible to you know, not just quantify how well we're fitting the data, but sort of the character of that fit. And so you know, back in the, in the paper by Torkel Smith and John Booker with their minimum structure inversion, um, once they had got their, once they'd constructed a model that was giving them an appropriate fit in terms of the chi-squared measure of data misfit, then they would look at the, the character, the color, the whiteness of that fit using a Spearman statistic. Um, 
fine and good piece of information. Um, there's a, a expanded abstract ASEG by Alan himself, um, where using another measure, the Durbin Watson statistic, which is you know looking at how the the discrepancies whether they're correlated going from one data point to the next, and this is the the sort of the extreme in your face kind of an example where clearly the clearly this calculated data is missing too high for all four of these and is for these data points and is missing too low for all five of those data points and so yeah that's not a good fit even if this is satisfying overall like a chi-squared misfit in hitting the target value so quantifying this this kind of character of fit, not just the, the level of fit. And so Alan actually incorporates this measure of the character of fit within the inverse problem. So we've got the a measure of the overall fit, but then um, this, this other measure of the quality of the fit to try and guard against fits like this that satisfy that overall level, but clearly are totally missing the signal in, in, in the data. So again, this yeah, sure, we can we can handle in our inversions um, the kind of noise that we have in our data, and and yeah, we, we should be able to do quite a lot. Uh, in terms of the story going on here, so okay, so I've set up misfit, you know, data. Arguably, data is the only thing we have in this whole inversion business. We've measured our data, we've got our data. Hopefully, we have measurement uncertainties. Um, all the rest is just us. Trying to do something useful, um, so so so, so data is important. Um, so at this stage of the talk, it's like, all right, yeah, I want to get a small small misfit because that makes that corresponds to the calculated data matching the observed and give me presumably, you know, if the calculated data match the observed data, then presumably the model giving those calculated data match the subsurface. Um, and, and so that's, that this is leading into the, this optimization, minimizing the data misfit. But of course, we all know that, oops, no, that's not going to work for us. That doesn't ever work for us. Um, and so I like this example. Doug showed this in his MNR, or a slightly different version of this example in his MNR. Uh, these are the pictures from the paper that he wrote with Yagua Um So DC resistivity, but a very good example. So the, the model at the top, uh, you know, um, I made up models so a synthetic example, it's reasonably complicated. This panel in the middle is the apparent resistivities for this DC resistivity survey. And you know, the model at the bottom is our minimum structure Occam style inversion. A little bit of extra information, the two ones in here correspond to <clears throat> equal balance between smoothing the horizontal derivative and smoothing the vertical derivative during the inversion process. And then just a hint, a hint of the reference model coming in here. And so what Doug and Yagwa did was, well, let's just take this data, invert it, but do so playing around with some of these parameters. And so the pictures on the left are three different models that are obtained. Let's see, the one at the top, the smallest model. So it's not minimizing the, the cumulative derivative, it's just going for the sort of smallest model. The one in the middle is um, just smoothing horizontally, alpha x is one, um, and then the bottom one smoothing vertically. Um, the, the, you know, the important part of the slide is that you know, this panel at the bottom right is the calculated data for the model on the bottom left. This panel in the middle on the right is the calculated data for the middle panel on the left. And, and so those three sets of calculated data, predicted data, they all look exactly the same. And they all match the synthetic data. So all three of these models, as far as the data misfit are concerned, you know, they're candidate models. They could represent the subsurface of the earth as you know, when we're only basing our inverse problem in terms of getting our data misfit down to a, a, a target level. So of course, non-uniqueness, uh, we can't just minimize data misfit, our data are not, our data don't include enough information about the subsurface in order for us to just do that. Uh, Another aside, so uh, 
I've never didn't done model appraisal, but I remember earlier in my career then model appraisal did get talked about a little bit how to do it. And so, yeah, I mean, like all three of the models on the left, sorry, I'm pointing to the screen, <laughs> all three models on the left, all give the same data on the right. So what is it about the three models on the left or what is it that all three models on the left have in common? What is it about these three models that's giving the same data? And we can kind of see maybe a concentration of connectivity here about redness concentration. Oh, we kind of have to squint pretty hard and maybe a concentration of redness here, likewise here and here, but you know, is there some way of taking those three models and appraising them, figuring out what they all, what they all have in common in terms of structure in the subsurface to which our data are sensitive? I don't know. Okay, back to the back to the storyline. Back to the storyline in terms of okay, can't just minimize a measure of data misfit. Um, we need to be doing something else, and of course, that's when we start thinking about incorporating some measure into our optimization problem such that when we minimize that measure, we get a model that is useful to us, that we like for, for whatever reason. And so the, you know, the classic, uh, the, the Alcom paper, Steve Constable and co-authors where not only is there the measure of data misfit incorporated in here, but there's also this measure of model roughness um, we're all familiar with this. And this is our example for the 1D case, the smooth model. And so out of this work, you know, the, the terms Occam's inversion, um, model roughness, <clears throat> excuse me, and thinking about smoothest model and simplest model, all those terms originated, as far as I can tell, from, from that paper. You know, that was very close thereafter, the paper of Torkel Smith and John Booker. Um, essentially, the, the same idea where, yes, there's <clears throat> excuse me, the measure of data misfit, a measure of the variability of the, of the model, the derivative of the model, uh, and then combining that cumulative measure of the derivative of the model with depth with the data misfit, balancing term, and then this becomes the thing that we're, that we're minimizing, that we're, we're optimizing. Uh, and some, just an example from their paper on the right, depth down into the ground and log connectivity and a few different models that have been constructed with the dash line being the, the, the truth. And so from that paper with Smith and Booker, the term minimum structure inversion, also flattest model, I think in terms of uh, the, the wording, the terminology um, that, that they used. So this was very important, this whole business of this combined <clears throat> optimization problem, measure of data misfit, measure of something about the model, such that when we minimize it, we get something, we get a model that we like. I mean, initially in those papers, it was very much thinking of the simplest possible model, Occam's razor. Um, you know, we do not want to have red blobs in our constructed model that are total artifacts, because then we get too excited and drill them and get disappointed. Um, so initially it's simplest. Also, I mean, there's so many things about this, but the introducing, yeah, getting the data misfit small, but finding the simplest model that does that, all of a sudden this gives us um, um, an inverse problem that has a unique answer. Uh, so all of a sudden we've got ourselves a unique inverse problem <clears throat> uh, that, that we can go ahead and think of. Um, so yes, of course, for very important. Um, uh, let's see a few comments about this. Um, I mean, th th this th this whole strategy, this whole approach, um, combination data misfit and measure model structure, especially trying to make the model simple. I mean, that has been just so successful. Everybody's using it now. Like it's all over the place, and it's all over the place, all over the place because it is useful. Um, I mean, one of the things that I th I don't know. Every now and again, I think about it. And so in, in, in my opinion, I think the, the reason it's so popular is because it's so reliable, it's so robust. Like the chances of actually getting a useful result out anytime you press go on the inversion is, is really high. And 
if any of you have ever played around with trying to do you know, sort of the old fashioned style parameter estimation style of inverse problem, maybe a small, you know, in the 1D case, two or three layers with the thicknesses and the resistivity of those layers being variable, and you then solve the inverse problem by uh, just minimizing the data misfit, um, even descent based method. Uh, the end result is so sensitive on the starting model that you end up having to rerun that inversion a lot uh, from a lot of different starting models. And that just ends up being, it ends up being a pain because you have to do it a lot. Also, you're never really sure if you have got to the, to the minimum. Whereas in contrast, this business of, yeah, minimizing data misfit, but also a measure of model complexity, I guess, then that flips it into a, unique inverse problem, it's got a unique answer. And because of this simpleness that we're aiming for, then it's, it's a very reliable, very robust approach. And so I think that's perhaps the main reason that everybody's doing it, everybody has been doing it. Uh, all right, another aside. So back in the, in the still in the 1D MT inversion business. Um, so Bob Parker, uh, established this this result about D plus models. And so the picture on the right, which is depth down into the ground, <clears throat> is in connectivity model of the earth, conductance model of the earth. And so basically a small number of layers, each layer infinitesimally thin, yeah, has a conductance, so connectivity thickness product that's not zero. And then zero connectivity in between. And so uh, Bob Parker showed that, let's see and if I can get this right, that if you have a set of empty data from one particular sounding and you cannot fit those data using this D plus style of model, then you cannot fit any 1D uh, error structure to that data set. So it's kind of like the, not, not necessarily the best, but if you can't fit your data using the D plus, then you're not going to be able to fit it using any 1D uh, earth model. No. Um, th these are the pictures on the left from the paper by um, Bob Parker, Kathy Whaler. <clears throat> and so the two on the bottom left, hopefully you can see the cursor. So there's uh, two different models. These were created using a, a minimum structure inversion algorithm, uh, smoothness models, but pushing the data misfit quite low. And so, yeah, they're smooth models, nice smooth curves but they're starting to look very sort of peaks and valleys of low resistivity. So, you know, not really all that different from a D plus model. So are these smoothest models heading towards D plus models? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Does it matter? Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to flip this picture on the side because <clears throat> from the sort of physics point of view in the EM induction, so one DMT got the plane wave coming down, that's what's down in the ground, essentially great big layers of nothingness with these uh, horizontal sheets that can conduct electricity in it. So in terms of the induced currents down in the ground that are happening with our MT situation, this 1D MT, then you know, those induced currents are flowing in, those, in these sheets. Uh, you know, they're definitely not flowing in the air in between, so flowing in those sheets. Uh, I want to come back to this towards the end of this presentation, um, so these D plus models. Um, right, so um, personal bias, <clears throat> not because I think it's all right and wrong, no, but just because I'm wanting to be talking here about something I know something about rather than talking about things I don't really know anything about. Um, so of course the inverse problem with the with minimum structure Occam style, Yes, um, we can't just be minimizing the data misfit because that's horribly non-unique and goes very badly. And so the strategy then is, okay, we'll add in the measure of model structure, give us our unique um, inverse problem, do it in a way that that inverse problem is sort of simple and well-behaved and that will give us one model out at the end. <clears throat> but of course, there's a very different tactic where, okay, rather than go for one particular model that fits the data, you know, so out of all these models that fit the data, pick one particular one. Well, let's go and just figure out what all the models that fit the data are, and then look through all of those 
either qualitatively or quantitatively to then assess those models. And so sampling and, and statistical ways of looking at the inverse problem. Uh, so I'm going to, I, mean, I think it's important. Um, and I think these approaches are important. Uh, got computational issues, of course, but I think they're important. So I do want to talk about them here and I'm going to talk about them using this, this example by Burke Minsley that I quite like. Um, so inverting airborne frequency domain EM data, this map on the left just shows that the survey lines, picture on the right is uh, stitched together 1D inversion results. <clears throat> this is for a hydrological investigation. So red is resistive, not conductive. Red is resistive, <clears throat> blue is conductive, excuse me. Um, and so this is a result of doing 1D minimum structure inversions all the way along the survey line. And so at a number of locations, uh, not everywhere, but a number of locations, um, Burke was doing Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling um, in, in this 1D inversion context of, of the data <clears throat> to, to investigate, yeah, the range of models, the types of models that fit the data. Um, not sure if, how well you're seeing this picture. So I actually just lifted out a couple of those panels and put them on here. Um, they were a bit blurry in the original PDF file of the paper. That's my excuse. Um, but the panel on the left is the is the data from one particular location with the, the error bars being the in-phase and quadrature um, values coming out of the TIGEM system, I think it was. And sort of the fuzzy, blurry gray lines, those are intended to be fuzzy, blurry lit gray lines because they are showing all of the sets of calculated data for all of the models <laughs> that are showing up as this gray, fuzzy cloud uh, on <clears throat> this picture on the right, which is depth, vertical axis, and then the resistivity on the horizontal axis. Uh, let's see, the blue line is the, the most likely, the most probable result out of this MCMC sampling, the fuzzy cloud grayness, the gray smudge um, kind of indicates the range, the red lines, dashed lines are the plus minus, uh, oh, can't remember, 95% confidence interval. And then the, the green line here is your um, smoothest 1D inversion result. Um, yes. So this sampling business, to rather than just focus on one particular model, even if you've got good reason for picking out that one particular model, but instead of that, then maybe trying to assess all possible models that adequately fit your data and then go and interrogate that suite, that set of models that you got out. Um, right. I guess I'm halfway through a third of the way through. So those are sort of um, selected thoughts about inversion background. Um, forward modeling, again, just because, you know, we're, we're, we're computationally, we are always up against it. We, we, our problems are too big. And so, you know, forward modeling is a critical aspect and, and doing forward modeling efficiently and well is a doubly, doubly um, important. We can't afford to be being wasteful there, just like everywhere else. Um, so I'm not really going to get into details. This is definitely pictures for the next few slides. I'm just trying to indicate the sort of the scale and complexity of forward modeling and the inverse problem uh, when we're, yeah, when we're doing our EM inversion in real life and the kind of EM inversion problems we want to be doing. Ah, this is a survey, um, uh, Johannes Kofel and, and a lot of others is in Mongolia. Um, kind of the thing I want to emphasize here is just, there's a lot of stations, there's a lot of data points and it's covering a large area. So from there to there on this map is 100 kilometers. And so these little circles you can see on this local coordinate system, they're separated by 100 kilometers. So a big survey area, lots of stations. And yeah, we want to be not only doing the forward modeling for this, but we want to be doing the inversion just because cool, it's interesting questions about the structure of the crust down nice and deep uh, under Mongolia. Um, more from a... Mm, well, mineral exploration context, this is a, a survey, a moving loop time domain, EM survey um, in Athabasca Basin looking for uranium. Let's see uh, this line on the left, hopefully you can see that the arrow, that little blue square is the transmitter loop. And for this transmitter loop, we make measurements, one makes measurements at that little red dot. 
and then transmitter and receiver move along to the next red dot. And so that goes all the way along this line and it goes all the way along that line. And just for those two lines, I think there's 64 transmitter receiver pairs. So from the modeling point of view, like 64 transmitter locations, um, time domain EM, uh, I can't remember, 20 time channels, 30 time channels. Um, you know, so fairly substantial problems when we're looking to be computing both the forward solution and doing the inversion. But you know what, typical, nothing untoward, nothing crazy about this, a very typical type of survey, EM survey, mineral exploration. Oh, right, and there's airborne. If you want to be a, go totally crazy in terms of number transmitter loops. Um, this is just a survey from somewhere in central Newfoundland just about gander. Um, I'm not sure how well you're seeing this map on the right, but the individual flight lines are, are marked. Right down at the bottom of the picture here, that scale bar is four kilometers long. Uh, it's a VTAM survey, I think. I don't know, I should have written that down on the slide. I'm pretty sure it's VTAM. Um, a you know, total of 900 line kilometers, and I didn't bother calculating it, but there's a measurement location every sort of two meters along the flight line. So uh, a lot of transmitter locations. Um, and so, yes, of course, there's strategies moving footprints and subdividing. And so there's definitely strategies for being sensible about this, but we could flip it around the other way and say, well, if we could do the 3D modeling for this whole, whole survey, then yeah, sure, of course we would, we would use that. Um, uh, in terms of for modeling, just a few more Pictures, um, uh, yeah, unstructured tetrahedral meshes, finite elements, or, or finite volume. Um, some of you might have heard me talk about this before. I mean, here I just want to sort of talk about the, the, the efficiency of the form modeling, because that's one of the, the benefits of unstructured meshes, whether it's tetrahedra or the, the, the non conforming, like the oak tree. Uh, Eldad Haber, Christoph Schwarzbach, uh, also. Alexander Greiver, um, those are useful in the sense that it's pretty easy, it is fairly easy to coarsen up your mesh away from your area of interest to get away to your boundaries. And so, yes, you can do this efficient discretization of your 3D for modeling space and the, and the inversion space. And so perhaps the comment here is, yeah, I think it is still worth looking at new forward modeling techniques to see if we can do this even better just because we're still pushed for computational resources and you know in real life the surveys are huge in every possible way um mesh free not sure about mesh free um in some ways i really like it um uh vitka and tescan did this for 2 dmt phd student jumbo had a look at this um in some ways I, I like this because it, it's looking to decouple uh, the cloud of nodes that we're using for the forward problem to solve, to solve the forward problem and the mesh that's being used to describe the earth model because sometimes meshes describing earth models are completely inappropriate for basing your numerical solution on. Uh, so just this idea of, yeah, I think yeah, I think I think looking at the forward modeling and how we're doing it and seeing if we can do it even better is still valid these days. All right, another aside. Ah, uh, one bonus that I like and I don't see too many people exploiting it. I don't think is that you know if you've got your finite element, finite volume, finite difference solution, uh, then yeah, you know your fields at all your nodes or edges or whatever, so you know it throughout the subsurface. So I like when we plot up the pictures showing us what's going on. As just an example, my PhD student, Chujen, um, transmitter loop, vertical conductor, quite a big contrast, um, time domain EM, these three panels are the magnetic field. Uh, so early time, uh, there's, uh, oh, sorry, yes, the, the, the background is, you know, it's conductive, it's not super conductive, it's not super resistive, so it's reasonably conductive. Um, so the background conducts, so at early times, we've got current system in the background that's concentrating the cyclic magnetic field here. But as time goes on, that current system in the background vanishes and it ends up just being totally concentrated in this conductive plate. And so this is magnetic field created by that current system in the plate. And so, yeah, I like looking at those pictures. It helps me a lot trying to figure out what's going on. Um, kind of the same thing here for this picture, that um, magnetic field avoiding this conductor 
so transmitter loop generating magnetic field, this is frequency domain, and then oh, totally not wanting to go into that conductor, uh, which is nice to visualize and see. Um, I think generally, um, I, you know, every now and again, I'm worried about the accuracy of our forward modeling for EM, uh, more so in the past than currently. I think we're doing okay, actually. Um, uh, although I do wonder, so the one thing I wonder about is in a scenario like this, which is not uncommon in mineral exploration, source on the surface and maybe a borehole, let's see, in this side, borehole coming down, trying to go find that conductor, then yeah, there's measurements going down right close to and straight through the conductor. And so is our EM modeling accurate for that, uh, accurate enough for that? Hopefully, maybe, maybe not. Um, okay, sensitivities, again, nonlinear inverse problem. Uh, we have to deal with the sensitivities. We need to calculate Jacobian or do something. So there's a number of different ways of doing it. Um, this is sort of the brute force way of doing it, where you, uh, you've you got your, you've done your forward modeling for a model. You perturb one of the model parameters, do the forward modeling for that new model, and then just take the difference and divide by that perturbed model parameter to give you um, this will give you one column of the Jacobian matrix at a time, I think. So if you want to build up the whole of the Jacobian matrix, then you need to do n forward modeling, where n is the number of model parameters. Um, there's the sensitivity equation approach. Um, if we have the matrix equation that represents our forward solution, and then we differentiate that with respect to one model parameter, mj. Uh, do the product rule on the, on the left hand side, the source term for the four modelings on the right, so that doesn't depend on our model parameters. So we end up with this situation down here. A, we've still got our forward modeling matrix A. This here is now, let's see, one column. So it's just for a single mj, but it's all values of the field. So this is a vector. So this is our one column of the Jacobi matrix. And then on the right-hand side, we have to take our forward modeling matrix, differentiate with respect to MJ. I mean, that might just be connectivity in one cell. So this ends up being a super, super, super sparse matrix. Multiply it by the field we have to get a, a new right-hand side. So in order to get this column of the Jacobi matrix, we just, hey, we just use our forward solver because we know how to do that with that matrix A. So we can just, we do not form the inverse of this matrix and then multiply the inverse of that matrix onto the right-hand side we have. We use our snazzy forward modeling routine to get this answer out of this system. Uh, again, requires, if you have N model parameters, then you have to do N forward modeling. Um, there's also the adjoint equation approach. Um, so flip it around, similar to what people do in seismics, I think. Uh, the way I have to think about this is back at the partial differential equation level. Uh, again, you can differentiate that with respect to the model parameter. Um, so L is essentially the differential operator. Um, I cannot see this equation on the right because my head is in the way. So I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but the, we introduce a Green's function that satisfies, you know, satisfies the same equation, same PD as a forward modeling, but has this delta function on the right hand side. So if you then take this equation, multiply by the Green's function, uh, take the Green's function equation and multiply by the solution and subtract one from the other and work it through, then the delta function pulls out what ultimately ends up being the sensitivity uh, at our observation location. And it involves summation over the cell of the Green's function with the delta function at the observation location and the field that we calculated out of our forward modeling problem. Uh, so if I got this right, then that does give us the Jacobi matrix one row at a time. Uh, and generating the Jacobi matrix this way requires M forward modeling, where M is the, is the number of data. Uh, this, this is the equation on the left here, lifted from the, the, the paper by Peter McGilvery et al, where you know, to get the sensitivity in the, in the vertical component of the itch field, for example, due to sigma k, then you're summing over cell k and you take the electric field from the source that you had and then this E tilde is the electric field for 
of vertical magnetic dipole source sitting at your observation location. Um, so those are methods thinking very much about forming the Jacobian matrix. Um, however, we don't have to do that. And because uh, the Jacobian matrix is yeah, big, but it's dense, it's full. It's, it's not some sparse matrix like the four modeling matrices. Um, this equation here is just thrown up there to show the, the, the typical kind of equation we get for doing our Gauss-Newton solution for our model update. And so the stuff here is just the matrix times model update right inside, which is the gradient. Um, and so if we're doing a conjugate gradient or some other iterative type of solution to this, then all we really need to be doing is multiplying this matrix times test vectors. And all that really requires, or the, the main computational burden with that is, yeah, the product of the Jacobian with our test vector. So if we're using some iterative solution to the matrix equation to give us our model update, the things we have to do are Jacobian times a vector, <clears throat> the vector that's being worked on in our iterative solution. Um, that gives us another vector that we put back into the iterative solution and on it goes. Um, a couple of slides back uh, from the two slides back from the sensitivity equation approach, then J, all right, yeah, we can get J by conceptually doing the inverse of the four modeling matrix on a vector, appropriate vector. But yeah, we don't actually do it that way. We just apply our forward modeling routine so we don't have to form this inverse matrix. So through this, essentially this sensitivity equation approach, using this forward solver, then we can evaluate these products involving the Jacobian matrix without actually explicitly needing to form and hold on to and keep and store the Jacobian matrix. Um, I quite like this method. Um, it does, it's a total trade-off between, yeah, you're doing, you, you save quite a bit of memory potentially, but you have to do way more calculations. So has advantages, but also has disadvantages. Um, okay, that's what I wanted to say for sensitivities. Um, I'm not actually going to say much about descent-based algorithms, just you sort of all use them. There's, there's variations. Um, this is just a typical sort of equation that comes out of Gauss-Newton that's getting fairly involved. Um, the term for the misfit, there's terms from model roughness, terms from model snowness, but that's okay. We can all work those through. And really, the only one with any computational expense is a Jacobian matrix one. So, so yeah, we can, we can do this. Um, here, I'm not going to mention trade-off parameters. Doug talked about this uh, in his um, MNR. Um, I'm just going to not mention that at all. Um, and just a couple of pictures. Like This is totally where I lifted pictures, I'm afraid, that I knew existed rather than look for the best ones in the literature. Sorry, but this is an example of um, trade-off parameter just prescribed cooling schedule. And this here, I guess, the squares Dark, dark squares, the data misfit, uh, decreasing as the iterations proceed. And I like this example because it totally shows a nice, steady, robust, reliable progression of this minimum structure style of inversion. Fuzzy, fuzzy blob inversion result, a bit reliable and robust. Um, you know, Gauss-Newton method is not the only way of doing this, of solving that system of equations. There's, there's a number of other ways. Um, there's you know, nonlinear conjugate gradients, uh, also data space approach. Um, these are important. I am not going to talk about them very much here, I'm afraid, because I don't know them very well and kind of, I'm sure I would not give them uh, full justice, me trying to explain them to you. I mean, nonlinear conjugate gradients tries to avoid having to think about the Hessian matrix at all and just go with gradients. And so saving time in that respect. Uh, data space approach, I mean, in the matrix equation for the Gauss-Newton method, that matrix is an n by n matrix, n's a number, number of model parameters, so that's going to be large. So a data space approach is transforming that matrix so that you then have to invert uh, or deal with an n by m matrix where m is a number of observations. So again, looking at um, efficiencies uh, in, 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 in the whole inversion process. Um, so one, one aspect of this approach, you know, it started off as being the minimum structure approach, the Occam style approach, uh, where we form an objective function with a measure data misfit and measure of model something or other, and then just 
proceeding to optimize it, I mean, that's readily extendable to all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, joint inversion, whether it's fuzzy clustering like what we've done or, or cross gradients, or whether it's focusing in on a particular measure of model something or other that you're then building in reference models and clustering. Um, so yeah, this, this approach, minimum structure approach, it can be expanded out uh, so that we get more and more sophisticated in terms of that measure of model something or other, which when we get a small value of it, we've got a model that we like, then, then we, can, we can go a long way with that. Uh, we do need to minimize it, which is you know, the more stuff we add into our objective function, the more difficult an optimization problem it becomes, of course, but nevertheless, it's, it is possible. Uh, so the conclusions, not the end, but the conclusions. So yeah, I mean, the, the, this Occam style, minimum structure style of inversion has proved to be very successful, especially for us in EM geophysics, also for other fields of geophysics. Maybe it's going to get into seismics eventually. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a very useful tool. It, it gives us a, a useful model of the subsurface. It does so in a reliable and robust manner. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a fuzzy blob, maybe it needs further interpretation, but it, 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 it's, it is interpretable. It's not like there's artifacts all over the place. So absolutely, <clears throat> this way of doing inversion, I mean, we've been doing it for years and we're going to go on doing it for an awful long time yet. Um, however, I mean, maybe there's, I mean, that doesn't mean to say we should stop. There's, there's potentially better ways of doing things in different circumstances. Um, and so one thing, I mean, again, some of you might've heard me talk about this before. Um, one thing is a style of earth model. And so the fuzzy blob kind of earth model that if you're in the green fields kind of scenario, you don't know what's down in the ground and it's sort of the first pass model of the subsurface, then yes, fuzzy blob model is really good. Way better than nothing. And it's very reliable and doesn't have artifacts, but certainly from mineral exploration context, maybe that's not the best kind of model. Uh, this picture on the left, the black and white one, is a vertical geological section down through the, the Lailor VMS deposit in Canada. Let's see, the blackest black on the picture is the mineralized zone. So I think it's in there. Can't quite see. Uh, all the other um, zones in here are the various other geological units. Uh, the group at the GSC, Ottawa, Canada, Seyed Masood and Sari, they've gone ahead and built a geological model using snazzy geological model building capabilities. And that's two pictures on the right-hand side of their geological model. Um, this is, there's nothing geophysics about this at all. This is from a geology paper in a geology journal uh, by Arias et al fairly recently. And this was me just searching through Google Scholar essentially for geology computer models. And so yeah, picture on the left is their geological section through the, the massive sulfide red mineralized zone built, you know, drawn from drill holes, those black lines. And then, you know, they've got a lot of drill holes, they've got a lot of drill hole contacts. And so they interpolate those contacts in between and come up with their computer geology model of what's down in the ground. Um, this is vertical section, vertical geological section out in the Athabasca Basin, uh, relevance for uranium exploration, layers of sandstones, um, an unconformity and then basement rocks. And there's these graphitic fault zones. <laughs> there's no graphite here, but graphitic fault zones um, that are quite often found where the uranium is found. So those graphitic fault zones are, um, are vectors or targets in the, in the exploration for uranium out in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, graphitic fault zones, of course, good conductors, but um, very narrow fault zones. You've got fault zone of connectivity and stuff around about that's pretty resistive. And so we've been having a go trying to work with uh, earth models that are a better representation of those very discrete localized conductive features. And you know, EM methods, uh, then it's that's important. We got this narrow zone that's highly conductive, very different from the resistive rocks roundabout. Um, so, arguably more of an issue for us than for gravity and magnetics, perhaps. Maybe that's not a fair statement. Um, we're trying to develop the inversion methodology where we move those surfaces around. Ha! 
back to how inversion was done decades ago. Um, the picture on the left is just uh, a result from the inversion showing the conductor and the fault zone coming up here that derived from the inversion kind of nicely explains why the this particular drill hole did not find graphite is it just looks like the graphite doesn't start till a little bit lower down. But anyways, thinking about an inversion methodology and especially a earth model style that's more appropriate for these, you know, localized, abrupt, discrete geological features and exactly the kinds of features that people are looking for in this mineral exploration context. Right, the last thing I want to talk about. Um, so uh, this is a picture from uh, the MT inversions, the MT inversion result under the Olympic Dam, an important mine, an important mineral deposit uh, in Australia. Um, and so MT inversions, Graham Heinsen and co-authors, uh, inversions down nice and deep, vertical scale, 60 kilometers. Um, so showing, you know, looking at investigating structure deep down into crust and beyond, as well as up near the surface and thinking of this ore systems business where, yeah, where do we find these mineral deposits? And is there some way that they are linked or we can link them to how they might have been generated in terms of flow of fluids and mineralized fluids and whatever. And so, yeah, this is a very um, important result. It's cool from our sort of science point of view, EM inversion has got shallow and it's deep. Uh, it's also important because it's um, you know, of direct relevance to a lot of other people not so caring about MT, but are looking for finding more of these ore deposits. Um, so definitely of relevance to the world beyond us, we MT scientists, we EM MT scientists. Um, uh, you know, let's see, typical model coming out of our Occam style minimum structure inversion, um, fuzzy blob, but yeah, in a, in a fine way, totally interpret this in terms of these potential um, pathways for mineralization or fluid flow or these connections, uh, maybe a heat source here. So it's a very interpretable, um, you know, deep resistivity bits in between. Uh, just a selection of other pictures. I mean, we've all seen these, uh, this is from Central Canada, uh, Alan Jones and Juan Holedo, I think. Um, but, you know, classic kind of fuzzy blob picture. Oh, nice red blobs here, intense circular red conductors, red blob down here and all these deep resistive bits. And then these connections, uh, these sort of, I'm trying not to say it, um, these um, conductive connections uh, between these various blobs. Uh, what else? Oh, one from uh, Darcy Cordell and um, Martin Unsworth uh, across Chile and into Argentina, uh, the Andes. And yeah, a great minimal structure inversion that's totally interpretable, nice and deep, 150 kilometers. Uh, in terms of the story here, yeah, sort of conductive blobs and, and these connections between them, connective blobs and connections between them, and there's deep resistivities in between. And so I guess where I'm going with this is, um, so this is one of my own results unpublished but, um, from my own code, but again, these connectors and blobs, connectors and blobs with the, the deep resistivities in between. And so, you know, I do wonder, going back to the D plus concept, so in 1D, where you have these infinitely thin layers, infinite connectivity, but finite conductance with nothing in between. And so in that 1D context, yeah, the currents, induced currents in the ground are existing in those layers and nowhere else. And then they interact and here you give your response. So is that what is, that what is happening in our 2D models? Um, you know, if we were thinking of the TE mode, the e-polarization mode, current going in and out, I mean, is that sort of the current centers in this model? I didn't go looking for all of them. Uh, TM mode, bipolarization, current in the plane of the section. Ooh, is that what those connecting bits are doing? Is that what those connectors are doing? Uh, giving, this, uh, giving us this sort of D plus style of model in 2D? Um, kind of, so what? Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Maybe an academic question of interest. Um, maybe, I mean, are those models sufficiently representative of the geology down in the ground? Are they good enough for us interpreting the, you know, the heat source and the, and the 
fluid pathways if we're looking at a mineral exploration context and trying to find ore deposits based on deep MT. So maybe academic question, but I am, I am curious about that when I see those uh, fuzzy blob models. So that's it. Back to the conclusions. Occam's Arsene is really good, but uh, yeah, one or two other things I wonder about the future. But yeah, that's it. Thanks very much, folks. Absolutely brilliant, Colin. I'll clap on behalf of all the all the listeners today, and um, you know all the viewers uh, who will be viewing this video over the next uh, months and maybe years. Uh, no, a brilliant overview of showing that there's still a lot to do in in the inversion side, and I, I agree totally with your thoughts about trying to make geologically realistic inversion models. Um, so. People can throw up questions, please, in the, the Q&A box. And um, seeing as we don't have a question, I'll ask one. <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind, what about dynamic meshing? Well, we see the geodynamic modelers have dynamic meshing. And so they, they try to make sure that they're, they're meeting the requirements of their numerical computations. And yet we EM people, we set up a mesh at the beginning of an inversion and it doesn't change. And as the inversion group progresses, we might enter for some for some blocks. Our, um, our meshing rules, you know, not more than a third of a skin depth might might be uh, not observed. Is there any is there anyone you know, or, or are you thinking about moving towards dynamic meshing? Um, I mean, a good question. I mean, I think um, some people are doing. Uh, sort of automatic kind of mesh refinement in the context of the forward problem. I think Kerry Key does that, has looked at that, um, and others. Um, I think Alexander Greiver in the, the non-conforming approach, he's, I think he's got um, uh, automatic mesh refinement, again, in the context of the forward solver, trying to make sure the mesh is refined appropriately in the appropriate places to get accurate results. Um, We've not done that just because it's, you know, it's, it's a non-trivial thing to do. So we haven't put the energy into doing that yet. Maybe we should, but we haven't. Um, in terms of the inversion, um, th there's definitely the, the, the business of um, how decoupling sort of meshes for the forward solver and the inversion. A number of people have done that, especially in the, 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 the footprints, uh, the moving footprint way of dealing with uh, an airborne EM survey where you just have so many transmitter locations and any one transmitter location is, is only sensitive to giving you data that's sensitive to a fairly small part of the model. And so, yes, having essentially having a forward modeling mesh that moves around with your transmitter and it's appropriately discretized to give you accurate forward modeling, but then having a different mesh for the inversion and then sort of interpolating, extrapolating, averaging backwards and forwards between those meshes. Uh, yes, people are doing that. Um, in terms of like, I mean, we with, with this um, surface geometry inversion, we call it with moving things around. Uh, and yeah, we have to generate a new mesh for the forward modeling every time for every new model. So the meshing is changing as we do it. Um, and I think I, I vaguely remember some people who have done uh, adjusted the mesh during the course of the inversion so that there's more cells where the conductivity gradient in the constructed model is uh, you know is, is developing. So going from a sort of starting half space to a model that's got variation of conductivity and then looking to see where the gradients and that conductivity is greatest. And I think I've seen people put more cells in there. I can't remember the names off the top of my head. I mean, so, so I think there's been bits and pieces of work. Um, you know, it's difficult to do. It's another added level of complexity. And so that's perhaps preventing a huge amount of work on that. Um, so I think it's still a question whether it would be useful or not, even in the, in the context of a minimum structure inversion. Yeah, I'm, it, an open question, I think. <clears throat> yeah, we have um, uh, Syed Mohammed. Abtabi Furo was very quick off the mark and has thrown three questions at you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll, I'll read them so we have them in the uh, in the record. Um, 
How do we deal with the half space layer in Occam's inversion of MT data? Do we consider it to be a constant value? If yes, how do you estimate its resistivity? If not, how much thickness is sufficient for it? So is, it, is this the half space layer at the very bottom uh, of the 1D inversion or of the 2D inversion? Um, I'm going to think it is. Um, I mean, that, the conductivity of that basement half space can just be another model parameter in with all the other conductivities or log conductivities of all the other layers and just be part of the mix. Um, also, the, 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 the measure of med model flatness, smoothness, it will capture, it will hook into that conductivity in that basement layer if we're thinking of the 1D case. And so that conductivity should all should be influencing the, the smoothness. So you'd hopefully end up with a model that maybe varies with depth, but then hits that basement half space and then is happy rather than being oops, too big or too small and getting a jump. Um, uh, I think it, whether it's deep enough or not or far enough away, then um, ideally, but then this can be expensive in terms of number of layers, number of cells, uh, you just have your half space deep enough so that the, the constructed model that you're getting out has already leveled off to either being totally fat, flat or totally smooth in the cells before you even get to that basement half space. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, when <clears throat> from my own experience with uh, regularized inversions, you, you've if you've still got a gradient at, on the boundaries, either depth or size, then your model domain's too small. Um, okay, so I had second question is, in the forward modeling method, especially in finite elements and mesh-free methods, we increase the number of nodes of the mesh around the anomalous body. However, the depth and shape of the anomalous body changes in each iteration of data inversion. Does it mean that we should change the position of the nodes at each step? If yes, how do you compute the Jacobian in the next step? I guess this relates to my question about dynamic meshing. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think um, if, you, if you're going with a totally fixed mesh and you're not going to do anything fancy and change it, then yes, you need to have sort of all of the area or volume of your mesh in which you think the target might be, that whole area or volume needs to be sort of uniformly meshed with a fairly uniform cell size, because you just don't know where your connectivity is going to go. Your, your target is going to be really, um, otherwise you're doing some automatic refinement as things go along. Um, I mean, the, 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 the sort of the mechanisms, the formulas for calculating the Jacobian, calculating the sensitivities, that doesn't care, you know, the, the sort of the formulas of what you're doing, that doesn't care whether the mesh you're using for this particular iteration is the same one as before or whether you've just created it new, you're still just working with your forward modeling matrix for that iteration um, and, and the cells, I guess, if the cells are changing, so your model parameterization is changing from one iteration to the next, that's not so good. I'm not sure what you do there. Uh, right, I think that might be all I uh, <laughs> all I have useful to say for that question. I'm afraid. Uh, okay, and then said so said question is about the geological units are different in terms of geology. However, in many cases, the physical properties are not much different. For instance, resistivity of granite and basalts. And besides, the resolution of geological models is much better in large depths than in our models. So how do you use the geological model in the empty inversion? Uh, that is the big question because yeah, because from quite a lot of our geophysics, there's, there's different geological units that a geologist are going to say are, of course, those are different rocks. But as far as our geophysics is concerned, it's like, no, they're both units of resistivity of 10,000 ohmmeters, so they may as well both you know, stick those together, call it unit A, that, and unit A is 10,000 ohmmeters, and so we can't tell the difference. So I think that that's a big question, because then it comes into the you know, constrained inversion. So yes, we want to bring in 
geological information or any other information we can into the inversion. But we have to be super careful when we do that, that we're not biased in the inversion results because you know, the EM data, the sensitivity, the resolution is not great. So the if we bring in con constraining information and it's not quite right, our EM inversion will probably nevertheless be perfectly happy to honor that not quite correct information. And then the constructed model is going to be a bit wrong, a bit distorted. Uh, it is not the case that the inversion is going to stop and complain because it can't um, produce a model that's consistent with those slightly incorrect uh, constraints. No, it will happily produce a model consistent with those constraints. And now that constructed model is wrong. So, so yeah, it, it, it's a big question. It's, and it's difficult. Yes. I remember in the <clears throat> late eighties, uh, early nineties, that some of the 2D inversion codes, what well, their approach to minimum structure was actually the minimum number of blocks and, and John Weaver and a number of others worked on, on that type of approach. I mean, for the, certainly in the mining game, as Syed says, we only have really, if you look at the um, you know, probability density, there's only a certain number of finite peaks. And so another approach could be to say that you're going to search for a model that only allows, you know, four or five or six, whatever, conductivities. Yes, I mean, there's, there's, um, so that, that's, um, I mean, there's a fuzzy clustering way of doing it. Um, so so that, that totally fits into just going with the minimum structure um, uh, set up minimum structure formulism with a, with a finely discretized mesh, but then one of those terms in the optimized in the, in the objective function is, you know, the aim of that extra term is to yes, cluster the physical property values in the cells so that they end up just being two or three or four values. And there's a number of different ways of doing that. So, so that's a nice example of where we can extend the, the Occam minimal structure approach and stick in more terms in the objective function that are going to do us something, do for us something which we think is useful, such as, yeah, force our connectivities in the constructed model to, to just be this value or that value, just be or or background and nothing in between. Uh, Christine, Bob. Bobby uh, asks about, uh, have you thought about including or tested multi-point geostatistics in EM inversion? Oh, this is terrible. Multi-point statistics. I think that's more a deterministic approach. I don't know what that means, I'm afraid. I'm totally showing my lack of knowledge about um, the non-deterministic ways of doing it. Um, I mean, so I can't answer that question, sorry. Uh, a, a general statement. I mean, I think I think the probabilistic approaches they, they've got, you know, they've got lots of advantages, and you know, the, the MCMC sampling being able to pull out a suite of models that are all fitting the data, and then going and interrogating that suite, uh, that has certain attractive aspects to it. It's just that it's so expensive computationally, it's so expensive at the moment that we can't even contemplate doing. I don't think anybody's had a go, is this true? Uh, for like full on 3D complicated models. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to be doing, but ooh, it's expensive. Yeah, well, we had that talk a couple of weeks ago from uh, Constanza Manasero that had this reduced order approach that seemed quite exciting. Um, oh, Chris Nind <clears throat> says, great talk, Colin. Theme of recent conferences, uh, Explo, 17 has been the integration of the geosciences. How good are the inversion methods for integrating other types of data, perhaps as constraints? So this is where I think our sort of, you know, this, this minimal structure, outcome structure, this mechanism is all in place and allows us to think about doing this in another uh, in, in one particular way. And so, yeah, we can have our objective function that we're minimizing and we just keep on adding in terms into that. You know, we design those terms that are going to do something good for us. And, you know, so joint inversions, um, that's pretty much the way that people have attempted joint inversions, whether it's based on 
physical properties or the cross gradient. And so that then opened up, up the way up opens up the way of inverting a number of different geophysical data sets for a number of different models, but all of which are sort of linked, coupled together to try and give us a single model that's representing the subsurface. Um, uh, bringing in geological information, I mean, again, we have that capability through the sort of constrained inversions where you have a reference model in, in this formalism, and then we can try and get our constructed model so that it, it is as close as possible or suitably close to that reference model. Um, so we, let's see, and so my thoughts are that we've got the capability and the mechanism. It's more that we, we probably need to understand better the information that's coming in. And so that's totally on the, on the bringing in the geological information. Okay, I mean, that, that has to be in form of physical property values because that's what our geophysics understands. Um, and actually the question a bit earlier where, yeah, rock unit A, rock unit B, very different rocks, but ooh, same physical property. So that's going to be exactly look like one unit for some of our geophysical methods perhaps, but okay, might look like two units for some other uh, physical um, geophysical system. So I think we've got the mechanisms. I think we're just not really understanding how to use them in a way that will give us a useful result out at the end. I mean, there's, there's probably other and different ways to do it as well. This moving surface business, trying to take in a, you know, a wireframe geological model and then move those surfaces around. But again, there's the issue in those kind of geological models, you might, you know, the geologists might be, that's the most obvious fault in the universe do between rock type one and rock type two. But if those two rock types have the same physical properties, then it's as if that fault doesn't exist in the geophysical model or doesn't need to exist in that geophysical model. So yeah, I think it, it, it's in, in, our, in our understanding, our thoughts, our concepts of how to do this rather than the sort of mechanics, the code to do it, I think. That's my thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, Yu Zheng Qi says, uh, Thanks, Colin, for a terrific talk, and I'm sure he's speaking for everybody. And <clears throat> I very much support your idea of including the real-world geology info into modeling and inversion. However, I suppose the, the real-world geology info is very hard to get, especially for the true one. <laughs> Most of the time, such geology info is also a guess from the geologist, which probably means we'll also have to include errors. I guess these are different types of errors. These are bias errors rather than random errors. That's that, sorry, that was me commenting. From the geologist, now model inversion if this method is employed. Thanks, Colin. Oh, well, I think those are good comments and I don't think we have any particularly good answers yet. I mean, it's all totally things for us to look at and try and figure out. Um, I will add actually the, the noise on the data Oh, we, again, we've got the mechanisms to, to deal with that and deal with that very, very well in the inversion methodology, but we hardly ever get good estimates of the uncertainty. So yes, and you'll never mind, never mind uncertainties or that fuzziness of knowledge uh, is, is coming from the, the geology side. <clears throat> so, yeah, I think totally good questions and I don't have the answers. Yeah, uh, Denise Varilshua, sorry about mispronouncing your name, Denise. Uh, great talk. My question is about scalability of the forward and inverse problems. We often talk about different mesh designs, but I'm also wondering what can happen when the cell number reaches, say, 100 million? Do you think the numeric or mathematical approaches are also important for the solution of the linear systems? Do you also wonder about the different numerical techniques to solve very large systems? Yes, definitely valid questions. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, for super big 
matrices A, super big linear systems equations, then we should maybe be a bit more aware than we are of the accuracy. Um, however, um, this might be when, this might be one of these situations where being an EM geophysics helps out a little bit, maybe. I'm not sure, in my opinion. I don't know whether this is right or not. Um, uh, let's see. I mean, in some ways, so connectivity in the ground varies over orders of magnitude. And I am sometimes amazed that we can even model anything correctly given those kind of um, ranges, but we seem to be able to. Um, but, but our you know, EM fields, our resolution, our sensitivity is very low, you know, the classic exponential decay. So maybe we, maybe our problem, the EM for modeling problem and then EM inversion problem is maybe somewhat forgiving because um, resolution is so poor. So we can have sort of inaccuracies in where exactly that interface in our constructed model is. Is it up a bit or is it down a bit? It's not gonna make any difference to data measured up at the surface perhaps. Uh, so maybe, we can get away with not being quite as careful as we should be. I'm not sure. I mean, that's speculation on my part. <clears throat> yeah, I, I did some work a few years ago with Randy's code, looking inside inside the the Earth and in, in thinking of doing down mine magnetotelorics. You might remember that work we did in Newfoundland. Uh, and it's you have to be much, much, much more careful with gridding when when you're actually inside the mesh. Um, Mohammed Kashkuli says, thank you, Colin. My question is about sensitivity, how to choose the minimum sensitivity as a threshold. Hmm. Well, uh, so sensitivity in terms of say log conductivity. So we're dealing with like a sensible model parameter rather than something over than the connectivity itself, very knows over orders of magnitude, then, you know, as far as the inversion is concerned, it's going to pay attention to the biggest sensitivities and then biggest values of sensitivities. And it probably won't take too long before the sensitivities are small enough that the inversion is not going to pay too much attention to them unless you do something special about it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. So, so I don't think it, you need to have a threshold that, that that's point zero 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 five percent of the maximum value. I think you just keep the main sensitivities in there and be pretty um, pretty aggressive in throwing away the rest. Um, I would quickly follow that up with asking, though. I mean, why do you want to threshold the sensitivities? Is this because you're, you're getting squeezed computationally and so you don't want to be calculating all the sensitivities you don't want to be storing all the sensitivities because because if if that's the reason for the question then there's some you know, you know people have been concerned about this for a long time and so there are a few well-established ways of calculating sensitivities and doing it in efficient ways that nevertheless sort of doesn't force you to throw away some of those sensitivities. So, so that might be my better answer to that question, perhaps. Okay, and the final question uh, is back to Syed. Um, minimum structure modeling always gives a model with sources tend to concentrate at the surface. In potential field data inversion, we, we could use depth weighting to alleviate the problem. Is that any similar approach to EM data inversion? I mean, a method other than changing alpha subscript S, which is completely subjective. Um, let's see. Um, uh, in Doug Oldenburg's MNR, he showed a DC resistivity result where they had used sensitivity-based weighting. Um, and, and that exactly got rid of that very sort of localized near surface structure. Um, so that 
that was a nice impressive result. I like that result. Um, uh, I think in EM, or maybe this is me, my thinking is that I've always kind of hoped that the, the frequency dimension of the data would provide enough information with where stuff is at depth up and down that, yeah, sure, all those sensitivities are a maximum right at the um, MT station or the receiver station, but, but that having that frequency dimension, so that extra dimension that's telling us something about depth that's not present in gravity magnetics, kind of hoping that that just does enough to, does enough so that we don't then have to do something additional like the sensitivity based weighting or that increasing alpha alpha x up at the surface to really squish things out. Um, that, that's that's my thought, which is probably not the best. Yeah, well, you you mentioned Smith and Booker paper, and I think the Smith and Booker paper showed us that, uh, in fact, you you can move where you're sensitive to by how you define what you're regularizing, whether it's uh, they were looking in 1D at uh, d sigma dz or d log sigma dz or d log sigma d log z. And all three of those gave different models that more emphasized fit in different frequency ranges. And so gave you optimal fits at depth or optimal fits closer to the surface. And that's something that hasn't really moved into 3D as much as it this the, you know, defining the regularization differently. In, in multi-dimensions, there's probably either intentionally or unintentionally with the, the cell size, because uh, that would be a bit, yeah. that'd be kind of equivalent to the either d by dz or d by d log z. Um, yeah. Okay, and the la <clears throat> last question from uh, Diloro Fitlo. And this is one that will stretch you a little bit, Colin. <laughs> According to you, what are the pitfalls one is likely to encounter in machine learning inversion? <laughs> oh, that's, that's that actually, no, that's, that's easy. Um, in, in terms of the literal question there, I, I, I won't even stretch. I don't know anything. I haven't ventured into machine learning properly yet. And so this whole this, this whole aspect of using machine learning for inversion, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've got no opinion on that. I haven't really started looking at it. I, mean, I think uh, Vladimir's talking on that. In, that was one of the ones you advertised, I think, yes, Alan. So, yes, so that's going to be meaning because he, he's got a paper out on using machine learning for yes. inversion. So yeah, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm curious. I don't know. I'm a bit skeptical, but Basically, I don't know. I have no opinion to offer. Great. Well, thank you very much for those wonderful questions, audience. And, and thanks very much to Colin for a, a brilliant talk. Mm -hmm. And I'll just uh, remind you, whilst we've been speaking, actually, we've had to make a change to the program um, due to personal uh, reasons. Um, we, we're, we have to shift the program around a little bit. So in fact, I'll be speaking next week and NASA will speak in, in, in what was my slot in uh, mid-May now. So I, I'll hope to see many of you next week where I'll be talking about publishing. Um, thanks again, Colin. And thank you for thanks everybody you. For, for, you. for being here and see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.